first attempt to climb the Eiger North Face was in the year 1935. It was during the final years of the Great Depression. A slow economic recovery had started. FM radio was becoming the main mass media, spreading news and music. On the culture scene was Art Deco and swing music. In the United States, Roosevelt was president, and the Empire State Building was completed four years earlier. In Europe, democracy was on the decline, with leaders such as Hitler and Mussolini. The former Soviet Union was led by Stalin, and in China, Mao Zedong became the leader for the Red Army after the Long March earlier that year. In July 1935, the 14th Dalai Lama was born. It was in August that year two experienced climbers arrived in Grindelwald, Switzerland. It was Max Sedlmayr and Karl Mehringer from Munich, Germany. Mehringer and Sedlmayr had studied the North Face and apparently concluded it should be possible to take a route aiming straight towards the summit. As soon as the weather conditions were good, they set out to achieve their goal. At 2 a.m. the night between Tuesday the 20th and Wednesday the 21st of August, they began their climb on the North Face. They had supplies for six days. The route started at a point on a straight vertical line under the summit. A straight line is theoretically the shortest path between two points, but it turned out to be a very demanding climb just to reach the first ice field. It takes lots of energy to climb that route due to overhanging cliffs covered in ice. Near the first ice field, they arranged their first bivouac at about 2,900 meters altitude, just over the Eigerwand station. The weather continued to be good the second day, but they moved slowly. Spectators at telescopes in Kleine Scheidegg could see that they were repeatedly protecting themselves from falling ice and rocks by putting their backpacks over the head. This route was obviously difficult, and they only managed to reach the end of the first ice field before their second bivouac, at the upper edge of the first ice field. After another night on the wall, it was Friday. They are moving on slowly over the second ice field. The Eiger becomes then covered in clouds, and the people at the telescopes can no longer see the climbers. What then followed was a change in weather, with the storms high up on the mountain and snow and rain in the lower parts. It was a thunderstorm accompanied by rockfall and avalanches with snow and ice. The bad weather continued the whole day on Saturday, and the climbers were not visible behind the clouds. They were out of sight for the people at the telescopes at Kleine Scheidegg, where the temperature now had fallen dramatically down to minus 8 degrees. The temperature high up on the mountain must have been much lower, and the following night was extremely cold. On Sunday afternoon, the clouds opened up for a short while, and the climbers became visible once again, still climbing upwards, moving very slowly over the third ice field, towards the flat iron, that was the last time they were seen alive. The clouds covered the mountain and the north face was hidden again as the bad weather continued. When it finally cleared up, the climbers could not be seen anywhere on the mountain. Many weeks later, when a German pilot flew close to the mountain with a Swiss mountain guide, they saw one of the missing climbers. He was frozen like a statue standing with snow up to his knees in the last bivouac at the top of the flat iron at the upper edge of the third ice field. That place has been called the death bivouac since that tragedy. It was the end point of the first attempt to climb the Eiger North face. The summer of the following year, in 1936, some of the best climbers of that time had arrived at the scene. Two teams have come independently and with the ambitions to ascend the North Face. One team was the two Austrians, Willy Angerer and Eddie Reiner, and the other team was two Germans, Andreas Hinterstoiser and Tony Kurtz. The previous year's climb had shown that the straight line approach may not be the best way to reach the summit. Not only was it difficult to climb over the ice covered overhanging cliffs, that approach also seemed to be very exposed to rockfall and avalanches. Hinterstoiser and Kurtz were considering a different route to avoid the problems from the previous year's attempt. It is striking how correct they were to avoid the straight path. 
considering the cruelty of fate that forced them to take the route they wanted to avoid and in the worst of situations. The 6th of July 1936 the Austrians Angerer and Rainer started a test climb just to the right of the first pillar towards the Rotoflu, the Red Cliff. It was during mixed weather conditions, quite cold and snowy. They were just test climbing at the time and arranged their bivouac under the Red Cliff. They then returned and waited for better weather conditions that would take about two weeks. The 18th of July, when weather conditions improved, the Germans Andreas Hinterstoisser and Tony Kurtz started climbing the wall the same day as the Austrian team. They initially climbed independently, but unite as one team under the Red Cliff. They then move on past the difficult crack to the stretch which is now called the Hinterstoisser Traverse. It is named after Andreas Hinterstoisser who took the lead and made a remarkable, technically difficult sideways climb which opened up the path to the summit for most climbers that followed even up to today. By making a 30 meters sideways move it was possible to avoid the exhausting climb to the first ice field that Sedlmeier and Meringer had made the previous summer. The traverse that opened up the path to the summit could also have been a safe way to return in case of an emergency if they only had let the rope stay in place. But at the time they passed the traverse the weather conditions were very good and presumably they believed they were going to return from the summit of the west flank of the Eiger. So Hinterstoiser pulled out the rope they had attached over the traverse and thereby their only safe way back was closed. Without knowing it, they had now passed a point of no return. From Kleine Scheidegg, people could see the climbers moving on through the ice hose. Then they noticed the Germans were moving up over the red cliff while the Austrians were slowing down. Apparently one of the climbers had been injured, leaning against the other. Probably Willy Angerer had been hit by a falling rock and got injured. It is uncertain where the rock could have hit, but it should be noted that the climbers at the time did not wear helmets. It is the randomness of the elements that rapidly can change any situation. They move up slowly to a ledge over the red cliff and arrange the first bivouac. Early Sunday, the 19th of July before 7 am, they start their climb again over the second ice field, but very slowly. Hinterstoiser and Kurtz have to wait repeatedly. They managed to reach just under the death bivouac before arranging their second bivouac. At this point a successful ascent seems within reach, but the injury seems to be an increasing concern. Monday the 20th of July at about 7 am Hinterstoiser and Kurtz were seen moving towards the death bivouac, but the Austrian climbers are not moving and eventually after a while the Germans return back. Apparently they were eager to continue towards the summit, but instead decide to help their injured friend. They return down to the bivouac, where they probably took the final decision to cancel the ascent and instead start a descent in order to rescue a team member in bad condition. When descending, they move fairly quickly over the second ice field. Abseiling down to the first ice field takes a long time. It is night time when they reach the first ice field. They arrange their third bivouac near Sedlmeier and Meringer's first bivouac. Tuesday the 21st of July they move rapidly over the first ice field. They then reach the Hinterstoiser Traverse, where they intend to return the same way they came. At that point it still appears possible to return safely. The only obstacle is just a 30 meters sideways movement. On the other side of the traverse they are not far from the station window, the Stollenloch, but suddenly there is a change in weather. Clouds are rolling in. Water has fallen over the cliffs and frozen to ice. Under these terrible conditions they had to try to reverse the sideways movement over the ice covered rocks. Hour after hour of attempts to cross the Hinterstoiser Traverse fail. The vertical rocks are totally covered in ice, making it impossible to go back the same way they came. Finally they have to give up and try the difficult and risky straight vertical descent. 
the same way Meringer and Sedlmayr have struggled on their way up. It goes over rock overhang, through a path of frequent rockfall and avalanches. When preparing for that descent, they hear the railway guard shout to them through the stolen lock window. At that time, there was still a possibility they could have succeeded. So they shouted back to the station guard that all is well. The station guard then concludes that they will arrive in short time since he could hear them clearly nearby and they seem to be okay. But the hours pass by with no signs of the climbers. The wall is now covered in clouds and the next time the railway guard shouts out, the answer he gets is desperate. It is Tony Kurtz calling out for help, shouting that he is the only one alive, all the others are dead. The railway guard shouts that help is coming. He then calls for a rescue team of Swiss mountain guides. Jungfrau Bahn sets in an extra train, with the rescue team going to the 3.8 km mark, which is the location of the stolen lock window. They get out on the wall and manage to climb about 100 meter under Kurtz. Although they cannot see him, they can communicate. He tells them what happened. He alone is alive. Hinterstoiser had fallen down. Rainer had been pulled to a safety attachment and frozen to death. An angerer had fallen under Kurtz and died hanging in the rope when falling. The mountain guides shout that they are going to rescue him. Kurtz replies that the only way to rescue him was from above, since he was hanging out from a cliff overhang. The guides had no chance of doing so, nobody could go up there over the ice-covered rocks in that bad weather. They shout back that they could not get to any point over him. Kurtz replies that they had to do that, otherwise they cannot rescue him. They ask him if he can endure the night. They will return in the morning. Kurtz then desperately, repeatedly shouts no, but there was nothing the rescue team could do that night. They shouted to him to hold on, and that they will be back early in the morning. It was a terrible situation. They had to leave him out in the bad weather, hanging from a rope under an overhang, in the middle of intense rockfall and in freezing cold temperature. It is hard to believe the rescue team could get one minute of sleep that night, knowing the sand was slowly running out in the hourglass of life for Tony Kurtz. The next morning, long icicles were hanging from Kurtz's crampons. He had lost his left glove and his hand was frozen stiff and was not possible to use. It was unimaginable conditions to survive that night, but he was alive the next morning when the rescue team arrived. It was then Wednesday the 22nd of July. The rocks were still covered with ice and they could not reach a point over Kurtz to rescue him. They were now just 40 meters under him. If he had a piece of rope to lower down, they could climb up to him and help him get down. They tried to send up a rope to him repeatedly, but failed. They decided to try a last alternative, which was to tell Kurtz to lower down a string to which they could attach rope, pegs and other equipment, which he then could pull up. But he did not have any piece of string, so they told him to gather strength and climb as low as possible and cut Angra loose from the rope. Then climb up to Rainer and cut the other end of the rope. That would give him about 8 meter of 3 plowed rope, which he could then unravel in 3 strings, which tied together would give about 24 meters of string. With his frost-bitten hand and his teeth, he struggled for five hours to unravel the rope, while rock and avalanches were falling nearby. At last he could tie the strings together and lower it to the mountain guides. They tied a rope, pegs, hammer and carabiners to the string, but when Kurtz pulls it up, they discover that the rope attached was too short and they told him to stop. A second rope is then tied to the end of the first rope to get sufficient length. The knot tying the ropes together is visible but not possible to reach under the overhang. After about an hour the abseil could begin. Kurtz lowers himself inch by inch by letting the rope slide through a carabiner, which was the only way to do it since one of his hands was completely frozen. As he lowers himself closer and closer to the rescue team, he reaches the knot tying the ropes together. Suddenly he stops. The knot cannot pass through the carabiner. It is jammed. At that point his feet 
are visible under the overhang and the rescue team can almost reach him, but he is hanging just out of reach. He desperately tries to get the knot through the carabiner, repeatedly with his hand in his mouth, but after a while he suddenly stops and says his last words in a clear voice. I can't do any more. Then his body tilts forward. It is as if time stops. He becomes motionless, hanging in a rope under the overhang, just a few meters from the mountain guides. That was the tragic ending of the second attempt to climb the Eiger North face. Newspapers were once again filled with opinions about the fate of the young climbers. After the two previous year's tragedies, climbing the Eiger North face was banned by the Swiss government, but that only held for about four months. Soon new climbers arrived. The dangers of the mountain had the opposite effect on many. It became a challenge to overcome. That year, two German climbers from Bavaria had decided to climb the North Face. Their names were Ludwig Ferg and Matthias Ribich. Before they arrived the 15th of July, there had been one incident on the North Face where one Italian climber got injured. The Italian team was probing the left part of the North Face, near the Mitteleggi Ridge, when they got caught in bad weather. One climber slipped and injured his leg. Fortunately, they managed to reach the cabin further down the Mitteleggi Ridge from where they could get help. The 15th of July, in a similar situation, an Austrian team was probing the same side of the mountain. They were planning to go back the same day and had very little supplies when they suddenly got caught in bad weather. There were severe avalanches and rain that day. They had to prepare bivouac without sleeping bags or supplies. The next day they climbed to the snow edge on the Mitteleggi Ridge where they prepared their second bivouac in the snow and ice. The night was cold with an intensifying snowstorm. They were exhausted and had no supplies. The next day they could probably have saved themselves by going to the Mitteleggi cabin further down the ridge but for some reason they decided to go towards the summit. The struggle in the snowstorm consumed their lost energy and one of them was now extremely exhausted. Part of the way to the summit they had to prepare a bivouac in the snow. From there they sent emergency signals, but eventually one of the climbers died the 18th of July. It was their fourth day on the mountain. Rescue teams were searching for the two climbers and so were the German climbers Ferg and Rebich. When they found the climbers, the Swiss mountain guides could help the survivor down. Ferg and Rebich helped by carrying the dead climber all the way down the Mitteleggi Ridge. Ferg and Rebich started climbing the north face the 27th of July at 6 a.m. in good weather conditions, with the climbers Liebel and Rieger coming along part of the way. But about 300 meters over the base of the mountain, Liebel discovers a dead body at the edge of an ice field, which turned out to be Hinterstoiser, who fell the previous year. Once again, they had to bring a dead climber's body down from the mountain. They cancelled that day's attempt, but carried up some equipment to a ledge as a preparation. Three days later, the 30th of July, Ferg and Rebich climbed the north face again, but bad weather is approaching so they just carry up supplies and equipment to the first pillar. They climb past the difficult crack and make preparations by fixing two ropes across the Hinterstoise Traverse to make sure they can pass that section easily and also return if necessary. They also found a perfect bivouac location just above the Hinterstoise Traverse where they left supplies and equipment. When they got back to the base of the mountain, bad weather breaks out. They couldn't make any attempt until the 11th of August when the weather forecast looked better, but they were well prepared and had made sure to be able to return across the Hinterstoise Traverse if necessary to avoid the disastrous situation the previous year. The 11th of August, they start out early in the morning. Already at 11 a.m. they reach the top of the first pillar, get some of the supplies they left there, climb up to the bivouac place, now referred to as the swallow's nest. They return and get the rest of the equipment from the first pillar and they are back at the swallow's nest at about 5 p.m. They were well prepared and they had comfortable bivouac place with all necessary equipment. The next day they climb up the ice hose overhanging cliff, then cross the second ice field and the third ice field and continue towards the flat iron. 
The spectators at the telescopes in Kleine Scheidegg can see them until they reach the flat iron. Then they disappear behind the clouds when they reach the death bivouac at about 5 p.m. From that position they can see the ramp and move towards it, but a rain and hailstorm starts. They cannot find shelter for a bivouac and carve out a shelter in the ice to sit. That was a long and cold night with lots of rockfall. In the morning they see more dark clouds approaching from the west and decide to return. They climb down towards the first ice field and then reach the swallow's nest about 5 p.m. They stay one night in the bivouac before returning. They reach the base of the mountain late afternoon the next day, after a well-controlled retreat from the highest climb so far on the north face. The ropes they had prepared were left attached over the Hinterstoise Traverse, which turned out to be very useful for the ascent the following year, in the summer of 1938. This was the most successful attempt so far and with no casualties. They had taken into account the knowledge from previous attempts in their preparations. The observers were beginning to feel that a successful ascent was possible. But as always, the random nature of the elements makes all predictions uncertain. In the next video I will tell the story about the first successful ascent of the Eiger North face in 1938 and also about the recent modern climbing. And finally I will put these events in the larger context with some thoughts about the history and the future. If you are interested in more details about the first attempts to climb the Eiger North face, there are many books to read. For instance, the classic book The White Spider by Austrian climber Heinrich Harrer.